On today's video, an extremely brief history of time and the ascent of man, how did we come into being? A reading from Letter to Pluto by Lou Trelevan and Create Your Very Own Planet. Who lives there? What do they look like? What do they eat? What do they do? Today's video is all about how we came into being in the modern lives we live today and beyond. It's like a brief history of time and the ascent of man all rolled into one. So it's a pretty big subject. Uh, we'd better kick off. Where did it all start? Well, 13.8 billion years ago, we had something that's called the Big Bang. Scientists think that everything got so dense and so heavy, matter was really tight, packed together, squeezing in and in and in, in what we call a, a single, very dense mass, a single singularity. And it was all so energetic that poof, a big bang happened and all the little bits from the big bang started spreading out and out and out to create our universe. It's been expanding ever since and it's getting bigger and bigger. So that was 13.8 billion years ago. Fast forward to 4.55 billion years ago. So that's quite some time later. And then that was when the solar system was created. So all the sort of bits that were moving outwards from each other also encompassed our planet, which began to find some gravitational pull towards each other and towards our sun. So they started rotating around and around and around in orbits, making the solar system. But life didn't actually appear on planet Earth till about four billion years ago. And it's not life as we know it. It wasn't people walking about saying hi to each other or even animals. Now, instead of humans, Microbes have been found in fossilised rocks in Western Australia. The earliest life forms were tiny little microbes, living organisms, and cyanobacteria didn't evolve till at least 2.4 billion years ago. So we're talking about 2 billion years later. And they were the Earth's first photosynthesizers. So they made food using water and the sun's energy and um, released oxygen as a result. So suddenly, we had an oxygenated um, atmosphere, which made the conditions right for us humans to come along later down the line. Another factor helping with oxygen was 2.3 billion years ago, the earth froze over and when it thawed out and the ice actually melted, it indirectly led to oxygen being released into the atmosphere. Animals at this point are all living in water. There are no land animals and the earliest animals are thought to be sponges and the very earliest are sort of jellyfish. So humans were still a long way off. Then 1.5 billion years ago, life forms split off into the three lineages that we know today, which is plants, animals and fungi. And they broke off from each other, but they were still probably all single celled organisms at this point. Then around 630 million years ago, animals with what we call bilateral symmetry um, came about, we think. So they actually had a front and a back and a top and a bottom, as it were, instead of just sort of being these tiny little blobby things. Um, and the first that we sort of know of are worms. About 397 million years ago, we got the world's first tetrapods, animals on four legs, and they would have lived in shallow water habitats. Things were still water dwelling at this point, but the four legs meant that they could then go on to conquer land and give rise to amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals as we know them today. I should point out dinosaurs lived from 235 million years ago to 65 million years ago. They were probably wiped out by a meteorite. Five million years ago, we, as in mankind, split off from other apes. So we decided, hey, we're going to go and be our own animals. For years and years and years, there were different humans living alongside each other. Eventually, Homo sapiens, which is what we are, um, became the superior form of human and we are the only ones that exist today. Between five to seven million years ago, our first human ancestors um, lived in Africa and then they began to walk habitually on two legs, Homo erectus. 
And then about 2.5 million years ago, they started to make some crude tools, which is one of the things that really separates us out from other animals. And then 2 million years ago, we spread further afield going into Asia and Europe. 1.4 million years ago, man discovered how to make fire. This is a real turning point because um, it was found that you could chip rocks into stone by heating them. They've become easier to break, so that helped with making tools. Um, you could make ceramic pots, for instance, and vases, so you'd be able to carry food and water and other items. And also, the ability to cook and get warmth and have light was massively important for us and our culture, allowing us to see in the dark and giving us protection from predators. Um, the cooking of food was probably the most useful effect of fire. Indonesia gave us the first cave paintings dating back to about 40,000 years ago. Um, there's a painting of a bull that has been found in a cave in Borneo. So humans were now getting down with the idea of art and being able to sort of record things and tell stories, um, which was also a massive step. Culturally, this meant that recreation was beginning to become a thing as opposed to just survival. On this point, we reckon that humans first began to speak to each other. Language would have evolved from sort of grunting and a few words progressed to the fantastic, sophisticated thing it is today. But it's really hard to date when humans actually started talking to each other. People have really wild variations from as late as 50,000 years ago to 2 million years ago. 8,800 years ago saw the first cities come about. Then 60 years ago, we saw the first computers. So there you have it. I've whizzed you up from the Big Bang to the modern day. And it's had to be a whiz because we're talking about billions of years. I then moved my timeline into the millions and then brought us up to now. In today's book, um, we moved to the year 2317 and a futuristic world in which people live on different planets. Letter to Pluto by Lou Trelevin. Why not holiday in the outer solar system, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto? Uranus, the coldest planet in the solar system. Uranus is perfect for your next skiing holiday. Wrap up warm and give it a try. It's brilliant. Can you escape the deadly blog ringed flapper? Find out on Neptune. Come to Neptune's water parks and try some fun sports while weird creatures lurk beneath the waves. Pluto, small, smelly and far away. Don't bother. Class 5H, Northcroft School, England, Earth. Tuesday the 10th of January, 2317. Dear Straxy, our teacher, Mrs. Hall, wants us to write a letter to someone on another planet. I've got you. I didn't know anyone even lived on Pluto. What's the letter, I asked Mrs. Hall. You need a pen, paper and an envelope, Mrs. Hall said. She's writing to a head teacher on Mars about knitting patterns. I've got nothing to say about knitting. So Mrs. Hall said to tell you about my family. Who'd want to know about them, I said. But Mrs. Hall said I had to get on with it or stay in at break. So here goes, my family. My big brother, he looks like this when he's chasing me. Scary. Little sis, always happy about everything. No one knows why. Dad, he mends computers. He likes taking things apart for fun. Mum, her name is Dawn. She has a gardening business called Dawn's Lawns. I asked her yesterday what she would have done for a job if she hadn't been called Dawn. She gave me a funny look. I'm stopping now as my hand is aching. Mrs Hall says we have to keep writing. It's a dying art. Good, let it die, I said. And then she said, you are staying in at break, John Fisher. John. Class 5U. Flump and Slurp Burble School, Dome 1. Pluto. Five day 13th Gagarin 2311. Dear John, thank you for your letter. It was funny. 
I've never had a letter and I didn't know what to expect. It wasn't that. You told me all about your family. So here is mine. Straxy's family. My gran. She's the head teacher at my school. Imagine living with your head teacher. Imagine walking to school with your head teacher. Mum and dad, they run a cafe called Dooley Boopers and we live above it. My dad is well known as he has a weird hairstyle that has never caught on yet. Mum's grandparents were the first people to move to Pluto from Earth. Their names are carved onto a stone spaceship in the town square. Fame. My twin, Brid, she's always around. She's even leaning over me as I write this letter. Go away, Brid. These are my pets. I have two pimpams and a striped zork. Actually, I don't, as we can't have pets living above the cafe. So I have imaginary pets instead. They are very well trained, apart from the zork, which keeps sitting on my head. You forgot to draw a picture of yourself. If you want to know what I'm like, look at the drawing of Brid. She's just like me. Class 5H, Northcroft School, England, Earth. Tuesday the 17th of January, 2317. Dear Straxy, Mrs Hall marked our letters out of ten for neatness. She gave mine a four. I thought she'd be pleased to read all that stuff about herself, but no. She gave yours a nine. My gran would make a very bad head teacher. She went planet hopping when granddad died and enjoys it so much she hasn't come home yet. Gran likes writing by hand. Just as much as Mrs Hall and is always sending us postcards that take weeks to get here. The last one was a postcard of a giant snail on Jupiter. By the time we got it, she'd left and gone to Neptune. Dad said the snail could have got to us faster than that postcard. I don't know how people ever wrote letters like these all the time. My hand is going to fall off and then Mrs Hall will be sorry. Mrs Hall said in the old days they used to write with quills dipped in ink. The quills were made out of feathers sharpened at the end. Why weren't the birds all bald then, I asked, and Mrs Hall told me to stop being so silly. And did I want to miss break again? John. P.S. Why did you say you look just like your twin? She's a girl. Dear John, of course I'm a girl. What did you think I was? A blue-headed squitch? Do you have them on Earth? We have loads on Pluto. They are giant birds with six foot long feathers. That's one whole dad. I asked my dad to build a bird table in the garden for them, but they squashed it flat and him because he was underneath it, putting the last nail in. But he's OK now. Your grand sounds great. I'd love to plan at Hop. I've never even left Pluto. I like the idea of writing with a feather. Did people really do that? Did birds go bald in the end? I would have knitted them jumpers in return. It's only fair. Straxy. Class 5H, Northcroft School, England, Earth. Dear Straxy, I asked Mrs Hall if I could swap pen pals, but she said there weren't any more boys to go around. I said I didn't want to write to a girl on Pluto, which it turns out isn't even a proper planet. But she said, Straxy sounds like a very interesting person to me. Rex Smith's pen pal collects old toothbrushes, so perhaps she's right. Then Mrs Hall said, why don't you find out a bit more about quills? So I did. Then she said, how interesting, John, why don't you write a report about it? And I cursed deep inside my head, where she couldn't hear, and said, yes, OK, why not? So here is a copy of it in the envelope, and you can read it and make it into a paper aeroplane if you like. And then Mrs Hall did a surprising thing as she came up to me with a present. It's a pen which looks like a quill, but really it's a biro and I'm writing with it now. I'm keeping the quill at school in my drawer. If my big brother knew I was writing to a girl on Pluto with a quill, he'd die laughing. John. A History of Quills by John Fisher. A quill is a pen made out of a feather, which seems a bit random. I mean, why a feather, not a stick? Interesting start, John. Anyway, turns out there is a reason, which is not just the nice fluffy bits at the end which flap about making you look like Shakespeare, but also the inside is hollow and filled with ink. Not while it's on the bird, though, or it wouldn't be able to take off. Also, it could write its name in the sky if it did manage to take off. What's the difference between my quill and my brother? One is full of ink and the other, guess which, is full of stink.
Not appropriate, John. Coils were really popular in the Middle Ages, and loads of people had them, especially monks who liked to draw in the margins of their books, which isn't allowed today. Worst luck. Then metal pens were invented, and everyone decided that they would pay for them and not pick them up for free off the ground, which is weird. Oh, except for some artists who still like writing in old styles for fun. Remember to keep to the subject. Quills have a rank like football teams, where swan is the top, followed by goose, and right down the list is turkey. I would like to try writing with a peacock feather. It would be huge and good for big things like motorway signs. Better. If you are right-handed, you should use a feather from a bird's left wing, and if you are left-handed, you should use one from their right wing. A good way to remember this is to imagine you are shaking hands with a bird. Lovely picture. An interesting, if rather short, history of quills. Try to report the facts rather than your own train of thought. Mrs Hall. Class 5U, Flump and Slurp Burble School. Dome 1, Pluto. 5 day, 27th Gargarin, 2317. Dear John, I don't know about Earth, but here on Pluto you can be friends with anyone. One of mine and Brid's best friends is a boy and he's bright blue. I guess it's different on Earth. I asked Miss Erdlepun, that's my teacher, if I could swap pen pals too, but she said there must be something we have in common, even if we are from different planets. So I thought hard and here's a list of things we have in common. We both have pen pals. Okay, that's a bit silly. Two, we both have mad grands. Not everyone does, believe it or not. Three, we both hate vomble fruit. That's just a guess, but everyone hates vomble fruit, right? Phew, yee. Four, we both like quills. Yours sounds cool. I wish I had one. Straxy. P.S. I also have an imaginary sork on my head, but Brid says that's not normal. I get the feeling Straxy and John are going to become great friends, despite being a boy and a girl, and despite the fact that they're so far away from each other on different planets. Pluto, of course, isn't an actual planet. It's classified as a dwarf planet and is the furthest away of the bodies rotating around the sun in our solar system. Now, that got me thinking. Space is so massive and there's so many different planets. Wouldn't it be fun to make up your own planet with its own name? Maybe it's got its own language, it's got its own landscape. Instead of having trees, could there be weird things? What are the people like? Are there people on the planet? So this is what I've come up with. The planet Plontanua is the name of my planet. And the ground is blue in the planet, planet Plontanua. And the people in the planet Plontanua are called Plontanuans. They're not actually people. They have wheels as legs. And they have antennae if they're male. The male Plontanuans are pink. And the female ones are yellow. If they're female, they have squiggly hair that acts as antennae to pick up signals. And that's how they communicate with one another. They don't need to speak. They just send out signals through the antennae and the aerials on their head. Um, they love to eat metal things. That's their diet, um, which means that they can eat keys and they can eat aerials and basically they eat space junk but they don't actually need to eat to stay alive they just do it because they enjoy it for recreational purposes what they actually need to do is to recharge underground now underground is orange there you can see the blue ground and they go down through these chutes and then they plug in and recharge and they do that instead of eating food if they want to travel they can fly to another planet by picking up a flying flag like this and then they can fly to another planet but if they just want to travel on the planet Plontanua they've got their wheels that help them get around and their pets are called Yukon and Squabbles. Yukon come from the planet hashtag and Squabbles actually come from the planet exclamation mark because there's a whole nearby galaxy that actually has all the planets named after symbols. Anyway that is my planet and my world you come up with your own one. Don't forget stuff like Star Wars and Star Trek they all started in someone's head. There you go. Happy planet creating. It really is good fun. Hope you enjoyed today's video. Please subscribe and spread the word. Bye.